Amen. So this morning, uh, we're going to be back in Mark chapter 1. Now, uh, typically, we teach, you know, through the scripture here, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, but it's been uh, five weeks since we've been in the book of Mark. So that's a rare occasion here, but uh, there's times now we're, we're open to the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit of God wants to do, and there's times that the Lord directs us in other ways, but essentially we go back to foundational things, which is teaching through the Word. And five weeks ago, um, it was Pastor Jason who was sharing out of the book of Mark, and he shared on a few verses in chapter 1, uh, just uh, essentially verses 12 and, and 13, talking about the temptation of when Christ was tempted. In verse 12, it says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. And Jason shared, and he really drilled home uh, a couple points. And one of them was the fact that, that to be tempted in and of itself is not, is not sin. And oftentimes we can have thoughts and things that, that we're plagued with, just the thoughts themselves, not giving in to them or giving in to certain things, but just tempted by them. And the enemy could come along and try to convince us that that in and of itself is, is sinful. But it's what we do with that temptation. And he spoke about how there's only one that's overcome temptation in, in every area. There, there's only one. That's Jesus. He says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So our example to overcoming sin, the example to overcoming temptation is our Savior. Our Savior who had to walk through that. How the enemy came to him at that time when he was fasting, physically the weakest point, and that's when the enemy comes at the weakest point. But, but Jesus, Jesus responded with all the temptations, and really if you break it down into three categories, there's just three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and the answer that Jesus gave to the devil each time was the word. So if there's something, man, if there's something to be learned from that, I, I mean, it, Jesus is trying to drill home a point. We have to go to the word of God to overcome things, to overcome temptation. Because what the Word of God does is it brings truth into the picture. It brings truth. And part of what the devil was doing, even to Jesus Christ himself, he tried to use the very Word of God twisted. Twisted the Word of God. And he did that to Jesus. Do you think he's not going to do that to us? Yes, he, he will. He will try to do that. But praise God for the gift of His Holy Spirit that He's given us to empower us so we don't have to be slaves to sin any longer. Jesus has come to set us free. Not that we were sinless. Not that we're sinless perfection or ever will attain that. But we're washed in the blood of Christ. In Christ's eyes we have His righteousness. And we have the ability to overcome sin and not to be slaves to it. And Jason also talked about the fact that he was in the wilderness. I mean, it mentions there in verse 14 that he was with wild beasts. And the fact that there's going to be wilderness times in our, in our walk, in our lives. And that the reality of bearing a cross. The scripture said, if we're to be his disciples, we're to deny ourselves, 
take up our cross and follow him. So those were like the two things that Jason really tried to, to, to drill into us, that the power is in Christ, you can overcome in Christ, the hope is in Christ. And all the answers are in Christ. But don't think that the Christian life is without trials and without difficulties and without struggles and without that cross. To pick it up. To pick it up and keep walking in His grace. So now this morning we're going to begin in verse 14. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. I'm going to stop here for a moment. Now the Bible doesn't, doesn't waste any words here. Many verses here in the beginning of the book of Mark. It talks about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the one who, who was before Christ. He was the forerunner, forerunner to Christ, the one who was prophesied about earlier in the chapter. Mark quotes Old Testament prophecy. Starting in verse 2, it says in chapter 1 here, Mark, it says, As is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist had a prophetic calling. He had an amazing privilege in, in what he was doing as being the forerunner to Christ. But he wasn't the Christ. He says that there comes one mightier than I, after me the latch of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I have indeed baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Because people had come to him and asked him, who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Who are you? And, and he just speaks who he is. He gives the prophetic word. And John knew that he had a prophetic calling on his life, that this was his purpose. To be that voice of one crying in the, way, in the wilderness. And in verse 14, after being tempted of the devil and Jesus beginning his ministry, it's interesting, it just says now after that John was put in prison. And you're not going to hear anything said about John the Baptist in this gospel account of Mark until chapter, chapter 6. And if you just, just look at that, you just see the fact that kind of John the Baptist just kind of just fades, fades into the background because he needed to fade into the background because John the Baptist isn't the Savior. John the Baptist couldn't forgive sins. <clears throat> John the Baptist had a great prophetic calling on his life, but he wasn't Jesus. And if we just look at the Scripture... It almost seems as like, like he's forgotten. John was put in prison. And what was he put in prison for? Well, he was put in prison because he was, he was willing to speak up. He was willing to speak up and call out sin. He was willing to call out the sin of, of Herod. He told Herod, it's unlawful for you to have your, your, the wife of your brother, Philip, Herodias. That didn't go over too well. Especially didn't go over too well with that woman there, Herodias. So, basically to please her, Herod put John the Baptist in prison. So here we have one of the Greatest men in the scripture that you're going to find. One of the greatest prophets. And here he is. He's in, he's in prison. So what do you think is going to happen here? Now a lot of you know the story here, but 
He's just looking at you like, this is a prophet of God, man. He's going to get busted out of prison or something. Something great's going to happen here. Something mighty. Well, let's see. Well, let's see what happens here. So I think maybe John thought that too. John's serving God. He's doing what he was called to do. He's speaking truth. He's preaching the word. He's calling out people to repent. He's doing God's will. He's walking in obedience. So let's see. Let's go to another gospel account in the book of Luke in chapter 7. Because this is interesting because this takes place right after Jesus came out of the wilderness. And just like Pastor Jason shared five weeks ago in the book of Mark that there's going to be wilderness times. And even though John was there preaching in the wilderness, his time in prison, I believe, was his true, true wilderness. He found himself in a place where he was sitting there while Jesus was doing great works. Great things were happening. Jesus' ministry was taking place. So in Luke chapter 7, it's right after Jesus rose this young man from the dead. He saw and had compassion on this woman whose, whose son had died. And the funeral procession was going by. And he rose this young man from the dead. And John's disciples were, were there. And it says, starting in verse 18, in Luke chapter 7, and the disciples of John showed him all these things. Those things we're talking about. They witnessed this taking place of this young man being rose from the dead. The miracles that Jesus was doing, he was healing people, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead. The blind were receiving their sight. The deaf were able to hear miraculous things. Verse 19 in Luke 7, it says, chapter 7, And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And when the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us to thee, to Jesus, saying, Art thou he should come? Or look we for another. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. So here we see John. In the Gospel of Mark, it just mentions before Jesus goes out to begin his ministry there, he's put up in, he's in prison. Well, John has his disciples come to him and they, they share with him all the great things that Jesus is doing. And John, you see, he knows his calling. He knew the scripture. He knew what the scripture said about himself. Actually, he knew that he, this was the Messiah. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is what he was saying before. And now he's in a place where he's been sitting there and sitting there, and sitting there. Now the scripture doesn't go into detail about what was taking place while he was in prison. It doesn't. It doesn't share in detail like it does with Jesus how the devil came and spoke words to him or assaulted him with, with lies and whispers that the enemy will do. It doesn't share that, but man, from the fact that John the Baptist is asking his disciples to go back and ask Jesus this, you have to know that there was great spiritual warfare going on. That John was getting more than likely words from the enemy, from the devil going, man, look, oh, he's, yeah, Jesus, this guy, Jesus, he's doing all these things, but look, look at you, man. 
Did he forget about you? He's so great. You're sitting here in prison. He can't even get you out of jail, man. This is who you serve. This is what your calling was. You're a prophet, aren't you, John? This is your calling, man? You can only imagine. The scripture doesn't give details, so we can only fill in some of those blanks, but those things had to be taking place to a great degree. And the scripture wastes no words. So what do, we, what do we learn here from John? Man, there's a lot to learn from John. There's a lot to learn here from Jesus' response to John. In verse 22, Luke 7, Then Jesus answering said to them, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended or cause to stumble in me. He gives them an answer to go back to John. He gives them an answer of truth. Truth. Listen, John, I'm reassuring you of who I am here. This is who I am. This is what I came here to do. I am the Messiah. I came to give sight. I came to raise the dead. The gospel is preached. This is the word I'm giving to you, John, to encourage your heart. Jesus is so compassionate, you see. In times of doubt and confusion. He didn't go back and tell John. He could have told John a lot of things. You know, he could have, he could have really hammered him. John, without faith it's impossible to please God. And that's true. That's the word of God. But we've got to be careful of how the word of God is applied and used. There are times when that word needs to be spoken and spoken loudly. And there's other times, like this time, where words of assurance need to be spoken. Reassured. John, this is who I am. What you've done is not in vain, John. Nothing you've done is in vain. But John, I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I am the one that you spoke about that said you're not even worthy to unloose, unloose my shoe latchet. I'm the Son of God. God manifests in the flesh, John. And it's interesting, because right after that, Jesus sent them away, and it says, when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. And he goes on to, to, to say what a, what a great man John was. You know, he speaks about the scripture. He speaks about the prophetic things that John did. And he says, For I say unto you among those, verse 28 in Luke 7, that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. But he, he speaks of John in, in, in a great way. You know, reassuring of what, what he did. And let's go back to the, the book of Mark the next time we hear about John the Baptist. Because I thought of this. You know, because sometimes we get, all of us do it. We have ideas. Ideas on what the Christian's life is supposed to be. The ideas on... What a, what a calling on our lives means. Ideas on what God has for us. Ideas on what's going to take place with our lives. And, and the reality is, we, we don't know. We don't know what trials we're going to have to walk through. We don't know what hardships God's going to call us to, to deal with. We don't know how He's going to specifically use something in our lives to increase our faith or to touch others. We don't know. We don't. We don't get to choose. It's like we go into a store, a grocery store, and like, yeah, I think, uh, 
yeah, I think I'll take that trial. That's not too tough. <laughs> Man, I, I get to, I want that one. But there's a lot of praise and great things going on and miracles going on and God's just praise and everybody's healthy and everybody's happy. And praise God, we should pray for those things. Those are good things. Who wouldn't want family members to be healthy and be filled with joy and all those things? But the reality of sin and the reality of life is different. And we don't get to choose what that is. Because I thought about John the Baptist, and I thought, you know, he was questioned like, oh, you're, you're like, uh, they thought he was Elijah, risen from the dead, some people thought. And you think about Elijah, prophetic ministries, Elijah, John the Baptist, there's many similarities there. But Elijah, who, wanted, who wants to be Elijah? Like, we're playing in, a, in like a, a movie and a play, you got a choice you're going to be John the Baptist, you get to be Elijah. I want to stand there before all them false prophets of Baal and Jezebel, total 850, and I want to call down fire from heaven. I'm going to stand before God. Amen. Everybody wants to do that. That's awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> That's, yeah. To have such courage to do what Elijah did and God to answer like that to all them false gods or what would be the show of hands for yeah I want to do I want to play John the Baptist uh, pretty soon after it starts I get to um, go in jail uh, I don't get out when I ask about questions about like what's going on here basically I just get told like yeah these great miracles are happening I am who I am and uh, then something, uh, then I get to get my head chopped off and displayed at some wicked, drunken birthday party. And the will of a wicked woman was done, and God allowed it. Man, God allowed it. Think about the, I think about these things, man. Who wants to volunteer to be John the Baptist? I want to be the forerunner to Christ. Really? Really? Man, there is a cost there. Let's go to Mark 6. Starting in uh, verse 14. And Jesus was preaching... Jesus was casting out devils, healing the sick. In verse 14 it says, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elijah, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man, a holy, and observed him. And when he had heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod, on his birthday, made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swore unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it to thee unto half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charge or a platter the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceedingly sorry yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner, commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head 
in a charger or on a platter and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mom. So that was the, the words of encouragement that John got while he was in prison from Jesus to reassure him that what he'd done was not in vain, to reassure him that he's the Messiah, to reassure him that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But the reality was the reality. It's, the, the Bible doesn't, uh, man, it doesn't mince words. It doesn't make it look fluffy. It doesn't try to use a euphemism or anything like that. John sat in that, that prison cell and he got greeted by this executioner. You can only imagine what this dude looked like. That was his job. What's your job? I'm the executioner. Not somebody you wanted to meet. And that was death that was coming. But death here on this earth came for John. But you see, the eternal things that, that Jesus has... There's nothing, nothing that can take it away. There isn't. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, you see. Nothing. It says that in Romans 8, 38. Death, no life, no powers, no principalities, no things present, no things to come. Can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen! There's hope in that, man. And there's hope when we look at our lives and we think about things and we can become disillusioned because today, today, you're like, man, I, I'm doing pretty good today. You know? Things are going well. I think I'm walking strong in the Lord. I can see what He's doing. He's moving in my life. And praise God if that's going on. Pray for more of that. But no, there's going to come times where there's going to be struggle. There's going to be disillusionment. There's going to be times where <laughs> we're in that wilderness place and we're being just bombarded by the enemy assaulting God's character. If God were good, then why are you enduring this? If God is merciful, then why is this happening? If God is gracious, then why did this, he allow this to take place? He's sovereign, and that's where faith and trust in God comes in and the power of his word comes in and to be reassured back in his word and by the Holy Spirit in those times is so important. And to think of those, not even just ourselves, but think about our brothers and sisters or those that we know that may have been serving Christ for a while and they, they may have been enduring a lot of trial and difficulty for a long period of time. And they walked strong for a while, and then eventually they, they caved. Eventually, the enemy was able to convince them of things. We should be stirred back up, as we're to stir one another to love and good works, stirred back up to know we're no greater than anybody like that. Just stirred back up to pray for them. Pray for God to get a hold of them again. Pray for God to break through those lies and speak words of assurance and truth and power and love that is only found in Him and found in His Word. To pray for them fervently. Because if this can happen to, to John and go through struggles like that, it can happen to any of us. That's why the Scripture says in Proverbs, a righteous man or woman falls seven times and rise up again. Just keep getting back up and keep getting back up and keep getting back up and keep serving God and keep crying out to God. That's the Christian walk, you see. Keep crying out to God. Keep leaning on Him. Keep depending on Him. Keep knowing that without Him you could do nothing. And there might be times in our life that we're going to be I get to experience things like Elijah, somewhat similar at least. And there's going to be other times where we might have to experience things like John the Baptist, both great prophets of God. They, they didn't get to choose which way they 
which way, they, what trial they had, what difficulties they would have to endure. If they did, John the Baptist would have been saying, Elijah, uh, you're, let, you're getting to do with that executioner guy that comes in and chops off the head. I get to call down some fire from heaven. And if you know Jesus Christ, one day you'll be able to talk with these guys. Ain't that something? Man. But they're just men. They're flawed just like me, me and you. Man, that's what the, the word just brings out again and again. No matter how great any man was, such as John the Baptist, he still had a need of what? A Savior. He still had sin. He still needed to be redeemed. That's all of us. We're all on the same level. And that's what the Word of God, it's so important to be in the Word of God. And because it's a lot harder to think really highly of yourself, it is. When you're reading the Word, it's so easy to start thinking highly of yourself when you're just looking at other people and like, well, I'll compare myself to this person or that person or the other person. Always picking somebody that you think that maybe I'm a little better than. It's easy to start getting filled with pride. Well, that starts getting shattered when you start reading the Word of God and you start seeing lists of sins or lists of other failures. You're like, man, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of me. No, that, no, that is me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm weak in that area still. Man, I'm, man, I need you, Lord. Yeah. Going back to the text, Mark 1, 14, 15. So Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's Jesus speaking there, man. He went around preaching this. The same message of hope, of eternity and salvation, that he gives us the privilege to, to preach because we've been affected by it. Our souls have been changed by it forever. This is what he preached himself when he was on this earth. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The gospel. The good news, the truth. I don't have enough time to go through all the times in the scripture that the word gospel is mentioned or the word repent is mentioned. We'd be here a long time. A long time. But there is a great emphasis on that. A great emphasis of the great commission. What's the Great Commission? Go. And do what? Go and preach the gospel. Amen. Go and preach. To who? All. All. Everyone. No one's left out. Praise God doesn't leave anybody out, man. Doesn't leave anybody out. No one. To everyone. Old, young, male, female. It doesn't... Everyone, everyone. Acts 3.19 says, repent and be converted, that you, your sins may be blotted out. And the times of refreshing come from the pre presence of the Lord. You know how to be refreshed? To think about the fact that our sins have been blotted out. It's so easy to be discouraged when we think about just situations, circumstances, life, the world that we live in today, there, there is. It's, there's just sin abounding everywhere. We're bombarded by it. We're bombarded by it everywhere. We're bombarded by our own sinful flesh. But man, we can rejoice in the Lord and rejoice always. Why? Because our sins have been blotted out. If you've received Christ, if you've called out to his name, times of refreshing shall come. In the When? From the presence of the Lord. You know how to be refreshed? I mean, the scripture gives the answers. We get refreshed by being in the presence of the Lord. That's how we get refreshed, man. 
allowing the Holy Spirit to, to strengthen us and stir us back up. And oh, how I need that. Oh, how I need refreshing from being in the presence of the Lord. Oh, how I need more of it. Oh, I pray, Lord, that you would grant me more of that. Please, God. I, I mean that. I need more of that. I need to be refreshed more. Amen? Amen. In 1 Corinthians 15, I mean, Paul just lays out the gospel just as, as clear as can be. He says, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Moreover, speaking to the Corinthian church, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, or Peter, then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep or they're dead. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So in his gospel presentation, he talks about people seeing the resurrected Christ. The word of God is true. It's authentic. It contains prophecy. It contains things that no other book on the face of the earth contains. The prophecy of John the Baptist. Pro prophecy of Jesus. Where he would be born. Where, where he would die. How he would die. There's so many things that are spoken prophetically before they took place. Thousands of years, some of it. The gospel. So when we share the gospel, the, the truth of it is that he appeared to those to, to people more than 500 at once after, after he was risen, man. Like I tell people, I tell them, you can't go dig up Jesus. There's all kinds of other gods, that false gods that people are serving today and have served over the years. They don't have to be made out of wood or stone. In some places they still are throughout this world. Other times there's people. But all of them, you can go dig them up, man. No matter how pretty somebody tries to make them look after they're dead, they're, you can go dig them up, they're dead. Our hope is in a risen Savior. The gospel of salvation. Not in anything that we do, but trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Romans 1 says we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. What's the power of God unto salvation? The gospel. There's power. Eternal life there. Romans 10. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 4, verse 5. But to him that works not, but believes on him, that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Let me read that again, Romans 4, 5. But to him that works not, in other words, you, there ain't no good works you can do to get to heaven. There ain't. Yeah. You can do a bunch of good works, but the problem is you've broken God's laws. You've broken his commands. You, it, there's no one perfect except Jesus. He's the one who, only one who fulfilled the law, kept it in all points. But believes on him that justifies the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? There we go. All of us. We were all ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. That's the amazing gospel of God right there. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. He justifies us. And our faith is counted for righteousness. That that righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to us. It's transferred to us. His perfect life for our sinful life. That's the greatest transaction that any man or woman could ever, ever make. But we also have to understand that 
you want to respond to that. If you haven't responded to that light of Christ, man, that's, you don't want to be in that place. In fulfilling one of the prophecies as Jesus went out to preach the gospel there that we just mentioned in Mark 1, in the book of Matthew, when Jesus went out to do that, he's fulfilling prophecy. As it says, now when Jesus had heard of John, this is in, this is in the, uh, the account in Matthew chapter 4. It says, in, uh, starting in verse 12 in Matthew, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast and the borders of Zebulon and Nephilim. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Light is sprung up. Those, peri- those people that were living at that time got to experience that prophecy firsthand. But so many since then have experienced a, a type of that prophecy, you see. And we need him to come into this land of the Tampa Bay area. The light that has sprung up in the shadow of death and darkness. Because that's where the light of Christ came into our own lives, you see. And you, people are given a choice. You can cling to that darkness. Cling to the darkness because you don't want to come to the light. Why well, don't We want to come to a light because our deeds will be exposed and our deeds are evil. That's what it says in John. But oh, how wonderful it is to have those exposed. How wonderful it is to have the light of Christ. In the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Man. That's what we want to see. We want to see light springing up where there's nothing but death, if you will. And eternal, people are standing on the the edge of eternity. I was thinking about it today. Um, There's different analogies pop into my head. Weird things pop into my head sometimes, but I don't say them all. (laughs) You you wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. Um, But I was thinking about the shadow of death and darkness. And like, be driving down like a, a huge mountain. And like you get to the top of this mountain and it's kind of twilight, it's kind of dark. But then it's complete darkness. And you're on the top of this mountain and there's the only way, place to go is down. And the lights go off on your vehicle. They don't work. They don't work. And you're going down the edge of this mountain, and now you you can't see nothing. Nothing. And you see that there's a cliff at the edge because this mountain is amazingly tall. A couple miles high. There's a long way down. But it drops off at a cliff. And the thing is, you, you don't know how long that is when you're in darkness like that. It, it's like you're playing games. It's like you're, you got the, the lights go out of that car and you're going down that, that mountain pitch black like the shadow of death. And there's a drop off of that cliff And that cliff is where you step into eternity. And you you don't know where that is. And there's, in that case, you see there's only, (laughs) that takes a miraculous situation to stop that. Light has to come and spring up. There has to be brakes that work. Because in this same thing, the brakes go out too. The brakes are out, the lights are off, nothing's working, you're, 
hurtling towards death. Because it's total darkness. And if you're walking apart from Christ and you're walking in sin and you're walking in darkness, that's where you're going. That's what it's like. And you have the thing of it is, you don't know where the edge of that cliff is. You don't. It can happen at any time. It's gone. It's gone. Sometimes when we see people that are young and strong and healthy and they die, it's kind of, a, it's kind of like a shocking thing, isn't it? When we read about a, or hear about a couple weeks ago, like a, like a Kobe Bryant and like eight other people. It wasn't just Kobe Bryant, there's eight other people. His, his precious little daughter. They're gone like that, man. Strong, young, healthy, wealthy, athletic, doesn't matter. Disappointed unto man wants to die, and after this, a judgment. It comes in uncertain ways. Sometimes there's things that kind of sober our mind up to that. I, I thought about it even more so because uh, in my job, just uh, less than two weeks ago, we were, I own a, a moving company, and we were doing this job, and we were dropping stuff off at a storage unit in town in St. Pete, and one that I've been to many times, and I knew like the manager guy that, that, uh, that ran it. And so we went there and he was supposed to have the, the key. And the customer had tried, apparently had his personal cell number, had tried calling him, he wasn't answering, wasn't answering. He didn't get back to her. So we still went over there to unload this stuff. We go over there and somebody had mentioned that he, uh, they didn't say his name, but they said, he, you know, where was there, went to lunch, he came back, but he's the only one that's ever there. He's the only one that's ever seen there. He manages by himself. It's a smaller storage facility. So, um, okay. And so we're waiting, and we're waiting. And I thought, man, it's kind of odd to take lunch at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon when you're closing at 5. But whatever. Might have been just one of them, one of them days. Maybe I had an errand to run or whatever. And then I'm thinking, I was talking to uh, uh, the guy that works with me, um, Logan, Logan LeBlanc, and I was telling him, I was like, man, and this, this customer here, she's nice, but I think she's going to go off on him. You know, because now she's going to have to come here, drive over here, and unlock the thing, because he had a key to the unit as well. And I was like, man, he's going to be upset. Well, she ended up having to do that and go through all that. I found out a couple of days later, well, there's a, about the best reason you're going to have for not returning a phone call or not picking it up or anything. He was dead. He had died over the weekend. It wasn't even that day. He died a couple of days previous, but nobody... Nobody knew about it there. That's crazy, but that, that's a sobering thing. He wasn't an old guy. He was right around my age. Well, some people might think that's old, but... <laughs> but that's a sobering thing. Somebody you talk to, you know, thinking, you know, he's not that old. You know, like, the next thing you know, boom, he's gone. You're like, man. But it, it's a sobering thought in regards to that, and just brings to light the importance of the gospel. The, the importance of the gospel. It's, that's where Jesus started doing, is preaching the good news, preaching the gospel. And the importance of that in our own lives and our hearts. That we can share with people, that they don't have to continue to walk in the shadow of death. They don't have to continue to hurl, hurtle down that mountain with the, the lights off and the brakes gone not knowing where, when that cliff is where they're going to step into eternity. But know this, it's coming. It's coming. Like when you're going down, that, there ain't, you're, gravity takes over, you're, you're going down. And there is an enemy of our souls that desires to do, to destroy us. Steal, kill, destroy. That's what he does according to John 10. That's what he will continue to do non-stop he, he, that's what he does but, but Jesus has put us here to help rescue people from that and if you're here today and you haven't <laughs> you're not sure if you you might be the one that's on the brakes are off and the, the lights are off brakes don't work I mean the lights are off and you're hurtling down and you don't have to keep doing that you don't have to keep wondering what's going to happen to you. You don't. Call upon the name of the Lord. Repent. 
Uh, just turn the way you're going. Change your mind about your life. Just turn to Christ. Surrender to Him. Believe the gospel that Christ came to pay the price for your sins. Going to verse 16, Mark 1. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Straight away, right away, they forsook their nets and followed him. When they had gone a little farther, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. Straight away he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. So Jesus starts right away. You know, that's what he says. Come. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come. Come, follow me. So now yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Come, follow me. Whatever you're doing, <laughs> whatever your goals are in life, it doesn't compare. It doesn't compare to this. Just, look, fishing's great, you know? No wrong with fish. I mean, you see who Jesus, right here in Mark, there's four guys, first, first, first four guys there, all fishermen. All fishermen. Unlikely people, you think. You think, well, well, you know, it must be the religious. No, not the religious folks who think they have no need of a Savior. He, he takes the rough and tumble type, the ones who desperately know that they, they're messed up. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you think that you're found, then you're really lost if you haven't been found by Christ. And that's the greatest thing. He gives us occupations. doesn't mean all of us have to leave and go, you know, leave our occupations and go do ministry or go do missions or go to another. He may call us to that. Praise God. We'll follow whatever he has. We don't know exactly what he has, but as we walk it out in Christ, we trust him and walk it out. But what he has given all of us, the same thing that he desires to make these apostles, fishers of men and women, of souls, going fishing for souls. That's the most precious thing to Jesus. He shed his blood for it. He shed his blood for us. He shed his blood for all men and women. That's the most precious thing. To become fishers. Man, that's a calling that all of us have. Do you want to know what, call, what calling you have? I, I don't know specifically what calling you have, but we all have this calling. If you know Jesus Christ, he's called you to be fishers of men and women, souls. That's what he's called you to. And just like these guys here, they're a mess, they're a wreck. They're going to stumble and bumble around. They're going to have problems. They're going to have difficulties. They're going to have doubts. But God's there to sustain them through all of that. And when he calls you, when he's calling you like that, when the Holy Spirit's calling you, you want to respond, man. Today, if you hear his voice, that, the Bible always speaks always, always about the present. The present. Why? Because what's past you can't do nothing about whether it's good bad or ugly and the future well future it's guaranteed in regard to what's going to happen prophetically and what the word of god says but as far as each an individual our lives and our future we don't know i take a breath i'm not doing that god allows me to do that we, we're not guaranteed it always speaks of the present. That's why it says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Today if you hear his voice. If you're hearing the Holy Spirit speaking to you, respond. If you're hearing the Holy Spirit speaking to you to lay down things, lay down things in your life, to follow him, respond. If you're hearing the Holy Spirit speak to you, and you're, you're his, you're a believer, but man, you're, you're struggling with things. You're struggling with some doubts. Come and be reassured by the Spirit of God. Be strengthened in His might. In His might. Not our might. We don't have might. He has all the might. He has all the power. Verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and straight away on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. 
And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, for what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. They were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? With, for with authority commands he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. So he calls them to come follow him. And they start to see these great things that he's doing. He has power over evil spirits, power over the devil. Fame. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. There's a lot of famous, famous people throughout history. You can name them. But usually that, that fame and that glory, it, it, it's so temporary and fades away. Two years from now, even people that follow football have a hard time trying to remember who won that Super Bowl. That fame that they had for those few moments, few hours, few days, few weeks, it's, it's fleeting, it's gone. But Jesus, Acts 4.12 says, there's, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ. That name of Jesus is famous through all the earth. And that's the name that we preach, and that's the name that we share, and that's the hope that's given, that name in Jesus. To spread that name abroad. Verse 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered in the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon, Simon's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, lay sick of a fever. And at once... They tell him of her. And he came and took her up, took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Jesus is so personal. You know, when the Bible teaches us, shares things in his word, it's just so so personal. He's with these guys. It says, Come follow me. So they're in they're in the house. And Simon Peter. His mother-in-law is sick. She's got a fever. They tell Jesus. Jesus just goes back there and, and, and heals her. Immediately it left her. But what did she do? See, when you get touched by Jesus, you want to respond. It says that Peter's mother-in-law there, she, she ministered unto them. She served them. She went about getting up and... and Serving them right away. When, when Jesus touches you, heals you in some way, it can be physically, it can be in an area in your heart where you, no one can heal and touch that area, and God brings healing. He does it to do what? So you can get up and do what? Serve. Serve. So you can go, ah, I feel better now. Let me go take a three, four hour nap. No, she felt alive. Alive. Filled with energy. She'd been touched by God, man. We need to be, yeah. Touched by God by being in the presence. That's where that refreshing comes. That we read it, that I mentioned in the book of Acts chapter 3. Verse 32, And at evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. Wow, that's a lot of folks. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. That's Jesus. He's doing all these miracles. All these people from the town are coming to him. He's healing. Healing. 
casting out devils. But what did he make a priority? What, where did he get the power? What did he have to do? He had to get alone with the Father. This is Jesus we're talking about. Jesus had to get alone with the Father a long while before day, and he was praying. That's how we get our strength. We're getting alone with God. Pretty, pretty simple. When we don't, we feel weak. When I don't, I feel weak. I do. I really start feeling like I'm going on my own strength. My, my ability to be patient disappears right away. My ability to be merciful or gracious starts to disappear. All the things that come with being intimate with Christ become weaker. Jesus gives us the example there. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said to him, All men seek for thee. And he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. He, see, Jesus needed to be about the Father's business. He needed to just... But in order to be about the Father's business, even Jesus Christ himself, he had to get alone with the Father and pray. Verse 39, he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him and saying to him, If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, forthwith sent him away, and said to him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it or proclaim it much and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city that was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. If uh, Josh and Dave, you want to come up, please? So we see towards the end of this chapter here somebody who realizes they, they have a need. Now in this day and in this time, in Jesus' time, this man had, had leprosy. But really that's a symbol that in a certain respect, not just of physical healing, but Leprosy, if you will, we all have the leprosy of sin, and we all need to be cleansed. But but you see Jesus' character here in this first chapter of Mark, you know, revealed. You see when this leper comes to him, and he kneeled down before him. And we see that at times... Other times in the scripture where people knew their desperate need to be touched, desperate need to be healed. At times evidenced by the woman who had an issue of blood for so many years. She knew all she just needed to do was just, just touch him, just touch his clothing, just touch, the, touch his clothing. And there was a huge crowd, and she fought through it. She wasn't going to let anything, nothing, nothing, keep her from Jesus. Because she believed that there was power, and all that she had to do 
was to touch him. And like this leper here, there's all these people coming to him. All these people. He's just taking time for them. Meeting them where their need was at. And this leper that kneeled down before him, meeting that leper where his need was at. Because he simply said, if you, if you will, if you will, you can make me clean. You can cleanse me from this. We know God's will in regards to salvation. Desires that none perish, but all come to repentance. That's his desire. People are going to reject that. But that's his desire. His desire is to plead with people in regards to their soul. Plead with people about their condition. His desire is to use us to become fishers of men and women. And we, when I thought of that, when I was reading that, you know, about... Peter and Andrew, a couple, couple groups of brothers, just, just rough and tough fishermen. And they, there they are, because they're like, man, I was thinking maybe they're talking amongst themselves, like, man, what do we got? They ain't got nothing better than that. Better than following Jesus? What could be that? Like, they can go get some fish anytime. And there's times where they did. Times where they got discouraged or disillusioned, you know, they'd go fishing. And Jesus would have to... Come on out, come on out, and after fishing all night, tell them where to cast a net. Life's in him. I think what we see here in this first chapter of the Gospel of Mark is an emphasis on the gospel. It starts out with the gospel. Starts out with the good news. But the relationship with God, that's just the start, you see. It is. But we always have to come back to the reality of the gospel. That our sins are blotted out. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we do, do what? Confess our sins. God desires to refresh us. In 1 Timothy, Paul says it's the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Glorious gospel. He says it again in 2 Corinthians 4. That the God of this world has blinded the eyes of people that they cannot see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Because it is glorious. It is. See, we, we talk about it. We use that word a lot. Oftentimes, words that we use or things we talk about on a, on a regular basis, it can kind of almost become common or ordinary. And God doesn't want us to have that to be common or ordinary for us. He, he doesn't. He wants us to, to be something that is the power of God to salvation. He wants us, when we share with people, to share with them the reality of truth, the reality, reality of the, the judgment to come, but the reality of the character of Christ. Who God is, it's revealed. That when he came to this house, when he's on this earth, he went and, and healed Peter's mother-in-law. He went, and this leper that came to him, who had been totally cast out from society completely and knelt before him. He touched him. He had compassion on him. He had compassion on him. And the message that Jesus started with is the same message. 
Repent and believe the gospel. The glorious gospel of Christ. And for us personally, as we look to walk with Christ and be strengthened in Him, He gives us the example of the one that came right before him in John the Baptist. And to be encouraged. Encouraged to know that where you're at, if you cry out to him, encouraged to know where you're at in your, in your time of struggle, in your time of doubt. You're like, God, I thought this was going to, I thought this Christian, man, I thought this was going to be different. I thought this was just going to be like, you know, like you're just on, woo, all the time. Like, I'm just on fire for you. Like, you just got saved. And you want to just dance and jump around and just tell people. And just, you can't contain it. And then you realize, yeah, there's going to be, man, it's going to be times like that. But, man, there's other times they're just tough, man. They're just tough. Dealing with hard things, things difficult to be understood. And like Jesus posed to the disciples after he after he preached hard things. Because great crowds followed him. Some of them followed him for the wrong reasons. They wanted the food. <laughs> they got fed miraculously. They wanted the food. Wanted, wanted some type of miracle. There's the other time where he he healed 10 lepers. Only one came back to, to thank him. Only one responded to that touch from God. But he wants us to be rooted and grounded in, in the truth of his word. Rooted and grounded in the fact that Whatever happens in life, whether it's a, like a, an Elijah story, but of course Elijah had plenty of trouble too because after that great time where he called down fire from heaven and stood for God as a majority, and he knew that. didn't matter if there was 850 people there. didn't matter if it was every person there on the face of the earth that was against God. He knew if he stood for God, that was the right place to be. But it's interesting that soon, soon after that, he found himself in a wilderness place. Elijah did. You know? This time with Jezebel. It's interesting. You got John the Baptist, Herodias. You got Elijah with Jezebel. Feared for his life. Was in a... Try to just go get alone. Get away. And God... Wanted to hear from God. Thought he was the only one. I'm the only one. This wicked woman's going to take his life. <laughs> Jezebel wants to take his life. He's the only one that's still standing. That's what he thought. No, no, I've got 7,000. Haven't bowed their knee to Baal. Not the only one, man. Not the only one. It might look a little different in your life, in your life, or your life, or your life. Not the only one. Brothers and sisters throughout the world, it says that in 1 Peter, that the trial of our faith is more precious than what? Gold that perishes. Anything. In other words, the most valuable thing on this earth, it, it's, it's more valuable. Why? Because it's precious to God that it might be found on the praise, glory, and honor at what? The appearing of Jesus Christ. And you know what? Elijah in that place it wasn't in the, the earth, earthquake or in the wind, the fire. It was still small voice. Still small voice had to come alongside, reassure Elijah, strengthen him back out, up, to go out and fulfill what he was called to do as a prophet of God. God meets you where you're at, man. He knows our frame. He knows 
our weaknesses. He knows everything about us, and yet he still loves us. Ain't that amazing? He knows the things that nobody else knows about. Those are things about you that not even your husband or wife know about you. And he still loves you. He still loves you, man. So as we continue in some worship here, let's desire to just allow the Holy Spirit to have his way with us. Just be, just be honest with God where you're at. Oh, he, he just loves that. He does. You don't have to <laughs> try to fluff things up with the Lord. Just be real where you're at. If you need the encouragement, you've been disillusioned with things, thought things would th- turn out differently or turn, are turning out different. I've been like that. Man, I need encouragement from the Lord. Man, I need his word to help me. Man, I need the perspective that's only found from the scripture and the Holy Spirit can give. Or maybe, like I mentioned earlier, man, there's somebody that you need to pray for. Somebody that you need to pray for. Family member, friend, a co-worker, a previous co-worker, somebody that was serving God at one time. <laughs> Served God for a long time and got off the track. Believe the lies of the devil. You see John the Baptist there in prison, there's times he, he couldn't go nowhere. He didn't have time to go. He, got, he had to sit in prison and ponder these things. That he couldn't go get, you know, he couldn't go anywhere else. He was stuck where he was at. There's no time to go somewhere else and relax or kick back or whatever. We don't know. The thing is, we don't know what situations we're going to be at in life. But we do know God's faithful in those situations. And we do know that God will come alongside and help. So pray for those. Pray for those who the enemy has gotten a hold of, man. And as we stir one another up to love and good works, the glorious gospel of Christ is the centerpiece. It is. You know, in the word, this is what Jesus started preaching. But as Jesus started preaching it, man, he was touching lives and hearts and had compassion. But he got alone with the Father. Pray that the Lord would help us Help us individually, help us as a body to have compassion upon one another, to be refreshed in the Spirit of God. Times of refreshing will come in His presence. Can't take that out. Times of refreshing will come. We're just going to just work it up. We're just going to, we're just going to get emotional. We're just, we're going to get His presence in here. He's gracious, and he meets us here. He is. And he wants us to be thankful that our sins are blotted out. Amen? Amen. Let's worship the Lord.